Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Nurse New User Training. I'm really happy to welcome you here today. Uh, we'll get started in just a minute. First, I just wanted to show you all what our uh, schedule is going to look like and tell you about some logistics. So we've muted you upon joining Zoom because we have so many attendees. We'd appreciate it if you could change your name in Zoom to be your name followed by your username in parentheses. Uh, in order to do that, you just want to click on participants, then more, and then that's next to your name, and then just you can rename yourself. Uh, we're not going to start any talks earlier than their time in the agenda. The slides are all available and we're recording these sessions right now and they're gonna undergo some editing and then um, we'll upload the videos after that. Uh, we have a Google Doc that you can use to ask your questions and what'll happen there is that we'll read the, the questions to the speakers and the speakers can answer them that way. And then at the end, we would really appreciate it if you would take our survey uh, to let us know how we did and what we can do better. So I'm just going to leave it on this for just a few, few more seconds or so, so that everybody can kind of uh, get into that Google Doc. Um, and Helen, would you mind um, posting the Google Doc link for people in the Zoom chat? That might make it easier for them to find it. Okay, so let's go ahead. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, so our agenda is first half hour, I'm going to welcome you and introduce you to NERSC. And then we'll learn about accounts and allocations, how to connect to NERSC using SSH and NX. We'll have a little break, and we'll talk about the programming environment and compiling your codes, running jobs, uh, debugging and profiling tools. And then we'll have a lunch break. And after lunch, we'll have a overview of the data system ecosystem, the data ecosystem. We'll talk about uh, workflows at NERSC, uh, file systems and the burst buffer, data transfer best practices and I.O. best practices, a little break to give you some time to think. We'll talk about Python and Jupyter and Shifter in deep learning, and then that'll be the end of the day. So thank you and welcome to NERSC. We're really excited to have you here today. Okay, so let me get to my next slide. Ah, so today I'm going to provide you with a little overview of NERSC. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started on that. So. Uh, as I said before, my name is Rebecca Hartman Baker. I lead the user engagement group here at NERSC and I'm going to provide you with an overview. So first we're going to talk about NERSC. What is NERSC? Uh, we're going to talk about the hardware that we have here, the software that we have here, uh, our guide sort of for interacting with NERSC and user responsibilities and expectations. So let's start with an introduction to NERSC. So NERSC is an acronym that stands for the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center. We were established in 1974 as the first unclassified supercomputer center. Our original mission was to do computational science as a complement to magnetically controlled plasma experiments. And so actually we had a slightly different name then. 
But today our mission is to accelerate scientific discovery at the DOE Office of Science through high performance computing and extreme data analysis. And NERSC is a national user facility. So from the DOE's perspective, they give out time on our machines. And this is kind of the percent of the hours on the supercomputers that were used per office in allocation year 2019. So there's these different offices. You can see they used different amounts. Um, so the big one here is basic energy sciences. Um, another pretty big one is high energy physics here, but all of the different offices get time on the machine. They get a slice. We have about 7,000 users with 800 projects, 600 different codes that people run on the machine, uh, hundreds of users on the machine every day. And our allocations are primarily controlled by DOE. So 80% of our uh, allocations go through the DOE annual production awards called ERCAP. And the, those awards range from, you know, tens of thousands to typically tens of millions of hours. These are proposals that you submit to DOE program managers. They, and they are the ones who select uh, what, um, you know, what projects should be awarded. Uh, then another 10% goes to the DOE Oscar Leadership Computing Challenge, which is kind of a high risk, potentially high payoff sort of uh, computing. So that's also a very interesting uh, way to get onto our machines. And then uh, the remaining 10% is our reserve that we use for our own special projects or we use for overhead for uh, staff use or things like that. So I mentioned that we have over 600 codes. Uh, this is, this is uh, an analysis from the 2018 year, but it's still you know, pretty current. So there's the top 10 codes, they make up 50% of our workload. And then the next 20 codes, well, 10 and then 10 more, uh, make up um, two thirds of our workload. So if you look at this, uh, if you look at, at, the, at this pie chart, this is sort of showing this. So VASP is our number one code, uses almost 20% of all hours. And then um, you can see from there, we, it doesn't take very many of them to make up 50% of our workload. And then uh, it just keeps going. So there's 50 codes that make up 84% of our workload. So it's, uh, we have a pretty wide workload, but you'd be surprised by how common some applications are. So our big focus is on science. So our users produce and publish more than any other center in the world, we think. About 2,500 articles per year in scientific journals. So in 2018, we had uh, 14 articles in Nature, uh, 31 in Nature Communications, 82 in other nature-related journals. We had 11 in Science, uh, 31 in PNAS. And also we have six Nobel Prize winning users. So we take great pride in that as well. Okay, so uh, next I'm gonna talk about nurse hardware. Um, and somebody can let me know if there's any questions about what I've said so far. No questions yet. No questions. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I posted the URL to ask your questions in the Google Doc, please. In the Yeah, right. So if you have any questions, please go ahead and put those in the Google Doc. Thank you. Okay, so uh, we're going to talk about NERSC hardware. So we get a new system every couple of years. And so you all may, since you're new users, you probably don't remember Edison. It was a great machine and we got it in 2013 and we, uh, we decommissioned it last year. Then we got, we got Cori in 2016 and Cori is our current machine that we have. And then um, starting at the end of this year, we'll be getting Perlmutter, which is our next system. 
And then after that, we'll get another machine. We don't know what it'll be called, but right now we call it Nurse 10. So we're always getting a new machine every couple of years that is more powerful and at the same time more energy efficient. And then we can deliver more science to our users. So let's talk a little bit about Perlmutter. So Perlmutter is going to be a, a system that's going to be three to four times more powerful than Cori. It's going to be our first system that's designed to meet the needs of both large scale simulation and data analysis from experimental facilities. Uh, so it's going to include NVIDIA GPUs and it's going to have AMD CPUs and there's going to be some nodes that have GPUs and some nodes that have only CPUs on them. It's going to have a really fast network called the Cray Slingshot Network. Uh, and it's going to have an optimized data software stack that will really help with uh, analytics and machine learning at scale. Another unique capability is it's going to have an all flash scratch file system. Um, and flash, you know, is a lot more performant than spinning disks, so it's going to be super fast. And then we also have uh, a readiness program for simulation data and learning applications and complex workflows that's currently going on. Some of you may be involved in that. It's called the NESAP program. And then um, our phase one is going to come this year at the end of the year. So we're super excited about the machine and we can't wait for it to be here. So we're naming it after Saul Perlmutter. You may have noticed we had Edison, which is, was named after Thomas Edison. We have Corey, which is named after Gertie Corey. And she was the first American woman to win a Nobel Prize in science for the Gertie cycle, which is a metabolic cycle in the cell. Um, but Saul Perlmutter won the uh, 2011 Nobel Prize in physics, and he actually still works at Berkeley Lab. Um, his project called the uh, Supernova Cosmology Project was a pioneer in using supercomputers to combine large scale simulations with experimental data analysis. So um, Saul Perlmutter, uh, we asked him, hey, can we name our machine after you? And he said, sure, but my condition is you've got to make it so that people don't have to type my really long last name in order to log in. So you, you have to make it so that you SSH to sol.nurse.gov. It's much shorter and people won't misspell it. So uh, that's how we're going to do it. And I guess what that also means is that I will never have a supercomputer named after me. Okay, so this is a, a sort of a map of our current systems that we have right now. So the big ma machine that we have is called Cori. And Cori is a uh, machine that has two different architectures on it. So it has almost 10,000 nodes that are of the Intel Xeon Phi KNL mini core architecture. And then it has about 2,400 nodes that are of the Intel Xeon Haswell cores. Uh, so it's, um, it's got these two different architectures and you can see we have a lot more of the KNL mini core nodes than we do of the Haswell nodes. Um, it has 1.2 petabytes of memory aggregate and it uses the Ares Dragonfly interconnect for communication between nodes. So in addition to Cori, which is of course the major thing, oh, I should mention, it has this burst buffer, which is an all flash file system for uh, optimal uh, performance. So if you're, if you're doing something that uses lots of data, uh, IO reading and writing, you could consider using the burst buffer for that. And it has a 31 petabyte scratch system. So in addition to Cori, uh, we have a big archive, it's HPSS archive, and we'll learn more about that later. Um, and then we have the community file system, and we have our home file systems. And we have, of course, auxiliary systems like our data transfer nodes, SPIN, and science gateways, things like that, all connected through our Ethernet and IV. 
and it's all connected to ESNet, which is the Energy Sciences Network. That is a fast network connecting national labs and other research facilities in the United States and actually over to CERN as well. Okay, so I mentioned on Cori, we've got these two different types of nodes. So we've got these Haswell nodes. The purpose of these really is for throughput. So these are sort of designed, the, the purpose of having these nodes is so that people who are doing like data analysis and things like that can get their jobs through. Uh, so we have some queues on there that'll, that'll even allow single core jobs. So you don't have to uh, use a whole node, you can just use a fraction of the node. And we have longer wall time limits in support of these uh, smaller jobs. Unfortunately, uh, it's a very popular resource, uh, and so it tends to have very long queues. The KNL nodes, on the other hand, we have you know like three times as many nodes, almost I guess four times as many nodes really. Um, so these nodes are really great for performance. Like if you can get your code performing really well, this is perfect for that. Um, you got to be able to exploit uh, many core architecture though, and I think we'll talk a little bit about that later today. Uh, we encourage large jobs on the KNL nodes. Uh, you actually even get a discount for in, in your charge for the jobs that use greater than 1,024 nodes or equal to 1,024 nodes. Um, it's, yeah, four times larger than the Haswell partition, has shorter queues. And in addition, we have a queue called the flex queue, which uh, can increase your throughput and offer substantial discounts if you're willing to be flexible about the wall time that your job requires. So for our file systems, we have the home and community file systems. Those are our global file systems. We have some local file system, which is the scratch and burst buffer. And then we have a long-term storage system, which is HPSS. And this is actually a picture of HPSS on the right. So our global file system. So we've got your, you've got your home directory and this is a permanent, relatively small storage for you. So we give you a, a 40 gigabyte um, quota in your home directory and uh, we don't change that. That's what you have. Uh, home is mounted on all platforms, um, but is not tuned to perform well for parallel jobs. It, so in fact, what, what we really want you to do with it is just use it for storage of small data, like your source code or your shell scripts. Um, we don't want you to actually use it in your parallel jobs. So uh, it has what's called snapshot backup. So if you accidentally deleted something in your home directory, if you had it yesterday, then you're good. You could just go into those uh, snapshot backups up to seven days back and retrieve that file. We've also got uh, the community file system, which is also permanent larger storage. That it's larger than home. Um, it's mounted on all platforms and it has kind of medium performance for parallel jobs. It's not great, but it's much better than home. We can increase your quota on community and it does have the snapshot backup capability. So we really want you to use your community file system directories for sharing data within your research group. So if you have like a big data set or something that, um, you know, everybody needs to use then put that one in the, in your community file system storage so that everybody can look at it. Okay. So next we'll talk about local file systems. So these are just local to the machines. So scratch is a large temporary, file system. So it's, it's, um, it has what we call a purge policy. So what that means is that if you have a file that has just been sitting there and not being used for 12 weeks, then we reserve the right to delete that file to make room for other files. The scratch system is optimized for read write operations and not optimized for storage. It is not backed up so if somehow your file on Scratch got corrupted or it got purged, then that's kind of too bad because there's really nothing that we can do about it. So Scratch is a really great place to stage your data 
and perform your computations and read write from during your job. That's what Scratch is really great for, and that's how we want you to use it. Okay, and finally, we'll talk about the burst buffer. So the burst buffer, you can have a temporary per job storage on it. Um, it's a high performance SSD file system, so it runs on solid state drives rather than on spinning disk drives. So that means it's a lot faster uh, and your IO pattern doesn't matter as much as it would on a spinning disk. Um, the burst buffer is exclusive to Cori, and it is really perfect for getting really good performance if you have a code that is constrained by IO. So if your code does a lot of reading and writing, uh, then you should consider using the burst buffer. And we'll learn more about the burst buffer uh, later today. Okay, so finally, we've got our long-term storage system, which is HPSS. And HPSS stands for High Performance Storage System. So it's an archival storage system, and it's kind of where you put your data that you don't need very often. So it's kind of a hierarchical thing. So first it ingests your data onto some disk arrays, and then after that, it'll store it in the back end on tape. So again, we'll see it more about it in later presentations. So before we go on though, I want to give you my favorite little analogy here. So I like to liken our file systems to and and our yeah, our whole ecosystem here actually to a giant kitchen. Okay. So let's say that NERSC is like a giant shared kitchen that has all the latest gadgets, all the super cool stuff. So computing is kind of like baking in our kitchen. Um, the input is, you know, your baking ingredients. Your output is, let's say, a cake. Uh, so NERSC itself, like the, the supercomputer, is like an oven. And home and CFS are kind of like your pantry and fridge, you know, where you store a lot of ingredients uh, that you might use fairly frequently. HPSS is like a freezer where you, where you store like the frozen blueberries or something that you don't use that frequently. And Scratch is like your kitchen counter. So when you bake, you stage your ingredients from your pantry and your fridge, or possibly from your freezer, onto the kitchen counter. And likewise, when we're computing, we want to stage our data and executable onto the Scratch file system. That's our countertop. OK, so after baking, then you want to clean up after yourself. So it's all right to let your cake cool on the counter, but ultimately we got to leave, leave our space clean for the next user. So uh, after a while, we will clean up if you don't, but uh, not in the way that you would want us to. So we're just going to chuck all your materials in the trash, even, even your cake, if it's there for longer than, than 12 weeks. So, I mean, we'll kind of, dance around your dirty dishes and your eggshells for a while, but eventually we're just going to take it all and just throw it in the trash. So that's something to be aware of. And that's why we need you to keep current with what's going on in your scratch space and clean it up when necessary. Okay, so next let's talk about software. So on a Cray supercomputer, the operating system is a version of Linux. It's kind of an optimized version. Um, we have compilers that are provided on the machines, and we have libraries that, uh, that are on machines. Many of them are provided by Cray, um, and then others we actually build for you. And we also have some applications software packages that we have for our users. And there will be more details in, in later presentations on how all this works. So we have all kinds of chemistry and material science applications that we actually provide uh, because these are very commonly used and we'd like for optimized versions to be used on our platforms. So that's why we provide those. Um, we have a new software policy. So the the defaults are consistent for one allocation year. So we use we have the same Cray programming environment software available as default for the whole allocation year. 
except in cases where we might have security issues or major operating system upgrades and we may not be able to continue supporting the same versions. Then our software that we provide by NERSC provides, uh, we have four support levels. So we've got priority, provided, minimal, and restricted. So priority, we provide it, we take, we, you know, we uh, take it very seriously, we have it on a high priority, we perform regular functionality and performance testing. Um, if we, if it's at a provided level, we'll provide it uh, and we regularly make sure that it works at least. Um, if it's minimal, we may or may not provide it to you. It's pretty low priority and we don't perform any testing. So it's kind of an as is sort of thing. And then uh, restricted is software that's not allowed on NERSC resources. So one example of that is export controlled software. We don't allow that on our machines. Okay, so then uh, interacting with NERSC. So let's talk about that briefly. So we have sort of three things here. So the consulting, our operations team and the NERSC user group called NUG. So here is the consulting and account support team. So when you send in a ticket, one of these fine people will answer it or triage it to be answered by someone else. So uh, in 2019, we handled 7,825 tickets from 2,709 unique users. And you can see sort of these different areas that we handled tickets in. So we got a lot of account support, running jobs is always a big one, software, um, data and IO, you know, you name it, we answer questions about it. So yeah, that's, that's what we do. And we promise that we will reply to you within four business hours. Now a business hour is obviously time that we are open for business. So that's Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Pacific time, except for holidays. We'll help you resolve your problem and keep you up to date on what's going on with it. We'll try to accommodate your needs that may not fit within our operating structure easily. And of course, we always welcome user feedback and constructive criticism. So for you, we'd like for you to help us to help you. So when you send us a ticket, it's helpful if you can tell us what is the problem, what machine, when did it happen, what modules were loaded? How did you try to fix it or work around it? Um, if you just send us a ticket that says my job didn't run, that's not particularly helpful. You know, we need to know what your job was, what you were trying to do, here's your script, you know, things like that. Otherwise, we can't really help you very easily. It'll just take longer. Okay, so next let's talk about our operations staff. So we have operations staff on site 24-7, 365 days of, of the year, Christmas, Thanksgiving, all the days to supervise the operation of the machine room. Um, so they are some really smart people and they know how the machines are doing and they can help you with some tasks like killing jobs that really won't die and changing uh, your reservation that's already running, stuff like that. But generally we ask you to avoid contacting operations except in case of an emergency. So if there's something really urgent that you need, then contact operations. But otherwise, they're pretty busy um, and they're kind of minimally staffed, especially right now. So we try to just let them do what they need to do without being interrupted. Okay, so next is the, uh, the NERSC user group. So this is our community of NERSC users. So they are a great source of advice and feedback for NERSC, we listen to what they have to say. Um, there's an executive committee. There's three representatives from each office in the Office of Science, plus three members at large. So if you're interested in, in joining that, um, we have elections every year. They, they hold uh, monthly teleconferences and they have a Slack channel. Uh, and so you can join it 
um, at this URL. You just need to uh, log in in order to get there. And then please also join us for the NUG annual meeting, which is going to be online on Monday, August 17th, coming up. Okay, finally, user responsibilities and expectations. So here's what we ask of you. Please be kind to your neighbor users. So don't abuse the shared resources. We have some problems sometimes with people who, who will uh, kind of overuse the login nodes and then everyone else who happens to be logged into that node suffers. So please don't do that. Uh, use your allocations smartly. So pick the right resources for your job and your data. And small jobs, as an example, those work really great on the Haswell nodes, maybe not so good on the KNL nodes. So, you know, just try to think about where you want to run your jobs and how you want to do it. <laughs> Back up your, your, uh, your data, especially stuff that's on scratch, which has that purge policy. Please acknowledge NERSC in your papers. Um, acknowledge us so that we can stay in business, right? If, if the Department of Energy thinks, well, there's no papers, there's no science coming from NERSC, then uh, we might have to go out of business. So acknowledge us so that we can stay in business and you can keep using our resources. And then finally, pay attention to security. Uh, don't share your account with others. And don't hesitate, if you're not sure, to let us know if you think maybe something's happened, maybe your account's been compromised. We don't mind false alarms. We prefer false alarms over um, not finding out about something that happened. So please don't be shy about that. OK, so thank you, and welcome to NERSC. And um, I'm only two minutes over, Clayton. You should be proud of me. Uh, so. Rebecca, questions. Yeah. So some of the questions in the Google Doc had already been answered. Like when, how, how does the NERSC 9 name come from? Where mm -hmm. is it, how is it named? And um, were the slides available? But there are a few others I think you could help to answer as well. There are also people asked, answered about um, how do we count NERSC publications? But we could also hear what you say about it, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, how do we count the publications? It's a very hard problem, actually. Um, so we, so somewhat we rely on self-reporting. So if you make a publication and you want to tell us about it, we'd love to hear about it. And in fact, we might even use it as a feature in one of our um, science articles or um, um, things that we submit to DOE to talk about NERSC. Um, uh, but then also we do, we perform searches, but we probably aren't seeing all of all of the um, papers that that um, are coming from uh, work performed at NERSC. But that's basically how we do it. Any other questions? Uh, yes, two more. Okay. Uh, what are the paths to access the different file systems? I'm sorry. What, what I didn't hear. What are the paths P A T H S to access the different file systems? The paths. Um, okay. Well, I think that will probably be answered in in future presentations. Uh, but for Scratch, there's a macro called Scratch, all capitals. So you can just do dollar sign Scratch, and that'll get you to your Scratch directory. Home is uh, by default. You're there. Yeah, home is your, of course, your default, and. Um, community file system um it's like slash cfs slash cfs gears slash whatever your project name is i think i don't know yeah dollars yeah. dollar cfs dollar cfs that'll do it too. it's to the root directory and then you go to your own project directory after okay. That. Right. okay see perfect <laughs> Uh, another question is, what is the definition of a small job? Okay, that's a good question. Um, so when I was talking about small jobs, I was really talking about what I was really thinking of was jobs that um, jobs that use like maybe one or two or a couple of cores, um, because we have we have this um, shared queue that you can use and you can take advantage of that 
and then you don't have to pay for the use of an entire node. Uh, you can just use part of a node and only pay for what you're, what you're using, basically. Um, yeah, I mean, you could run, you can run single node jobs on KNL, which is totally fine. Um, and you can probably get pretty good throughput from that as well. Um, but yeah, that's kind of what I was really meaning was jobs that don't, they don't use any MPI. They, they don't even necessarily use any threading. Those jobs are really better on, on the Haswell nodes rather than the KNL nodes. That's a good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, thanks, Rebecca. All right. Well, thank you all.